In the early morning hours of May 25th, Skylab 2, with both thermal shields stowed aboard, was well along in the countdown. The crew, meanwhile, made ready to embark on their historic mission. This all-Navy crew consisted of Captain Charles Pete Conrad, Skylab commander, a veteran of both the Gemini and Apollo programs. Commander Paul Weitz, who would be Skylab pilot for the mission, had been a member of the support crew of Apollo 12. And Commander Joseph Kerwin, scientist pilot, who would be the first American physician in space. The 10-day delay had been a giant cram course for all concerned, especially for the crew. And their job was only partially complete. The execution of all the planning effort was now solely in their hands. smooth launch, Skylab 2 maneuvered to the proper flight path attitude for its initial downrange orbit. By mid-afternoon, the crew had overtaken the workshop. TV picture beginning to come in now to the control center. Skylab Houston, we're AOS at Guam for the next 10 minutes. Sally, oh, the Skylab. We got her in daylight at 1.5 miles, 29 feet per second. Roger, Pete, copy. They effected rendezvous and performed a fly-around to assess the damage. Most predictions were confirmed. Okay, Houston, the meteoroid shield area is solid gold. Roger, copy. His brief description is his suspected solar wing... One, two, right? No, two right. is gone. Completely off the bird. Solar wing one is in fact partially deployed and the reason that you've got different readings not symmetric between your three solar panels is there's a bulge of meteorite shield underneath it in the middle and it looks to be holding it down i roger copy okay houston it looks like the meteorite shield at the upper vent panel on the sand wing has wrapped around it just slightly are we now my guess is that our easiest thing to do is just go to the end and try and deploy it. Roger. Uh, Pete, which, from which side of the SAS is the meteoroid shield slightly wrapped around? Is it on the side of the main tunnel? Or Before docking, the, uh, the crew side? attempted to free the wing. The other side, Dick. Although the try was unsuccessful, the TV pictures seen here proved invaluable in devising the technique that ultimately worked. Following a night's sleep in the command module, the crew spent the morning of Saturday, the 26th, activating and checking systems in the multiple docking adapter and airlock module. Projections showed that if the present trend continued, the workshop would be below 100 degrees the following day. It wouldn't be the most comfortable environment, but after a discussion with the crew, the decision was made to proceed the next morning with the normal flight plan. The crew put in a long, trying day activating the workshop. Getting things organized and in the proper place was a chore in itself. However, they were discovering to their satisfaction that moving big pieces of gear presented no problem in the weightless environment. By noon, Monday the 28th, with the workshop completely activated, primary emphasis was on getting the biomedical experiment started. In addition to these and other medical experiments, science experiments were simultaneously being performed. Here, Pete Conrad operates the Apollo telescope mount control and display panel in preparation for the solar physics studies. In subsequent operations, data such as this active region of the sun was recorded by the telescope. The Earth Resources experiments also got underway after activation of the six remote sensing systems. Mark F-192, I got a ready light. We just came out from over the clouds. How about that? Auto sequence start on 90 and uh, UEPC go. 
From a broad field of view provided by this large space platform, the systems began photographing selected portions of the Earth's surface in the visible and near infrared spectral regions. Although the crew had earlier encountered a number of equipment problems, the result of excessive temperatures, the prospects now looked bright for a full 28-day mission. The temperature had stabilized in the mid-70s. The food was good, and so was morale. And up to now, the 4,700 watts of available power appeared to be adequate as long as high-load experiments were staggered. However, by the fifth day, some of the storage batteries had begun to perform in a degraded manner. The power shortage grew critical, and it became apparent that to carry out the mission, the jam solar panel would have to be deployed. Meanwhile, at Marshall, in the underwater simulator, techniques were being developed based on TV coverage of the solar wing. Using only tools and equipment like those aboard Skylab, the backup crew developed a set of procedures they felt would do the job. On June 7th, astronauts Conrad and Kerwin made their exit to put the plan into operation. Just take your time. Okay, Houston, we're out there. We, uh, we have the debris in sight. There looks like enough room to get the cutter. And uh, I'm trying to help Joe stabilize. As the simulations had shown, access to the solar wing was the big problem, what with few handholds or foot restraints. It was solved by joining pole sections of the twin pole sunshade, anchoring it by hooking a pair of cutters onto the strap that held the wing. Thus, a temporary handrail was fashioned that allowed Pete Conrad access to the solar wing, where he attached a tether. The cutters then severed the strap and the tether was pulled taut to free the wing actuator. After the crew returned to Skylab, an attitude change placed the solar array system into the sun, where after a period of warming the hydraulic dampers, the panel arrays fully deployed. Within hours, the electrical power surged to almost double the previous level. It meant that the power management scheme could be abandoned and the original flight plan could be resumed. In the days that followed, the nagging problems that had plagued the astronauts from the start began to resolve. The mission began to sound much more routine, more like a normal working day. Experiments were coming off like clockwork, and a wealth of scientific data was being gathered. On day 29, after performing final closeout of the orbital workshop, the crew donned spacesuits for the return leg of their mission. Skylab Houston, we're in that hole, CMG. You're go for undocking. Okay, stand by. Roger. Okay, we're free. We got four tenths of a foot per second, Houston. Roger. Bye-bye, Skylab. After undocking, they remained on station briefly to obtain photographic coverage. Following deorbit, the command module, its heat shield trailing a fiery plume, re-entered the atmosphere. For the first time in about a month, the crew experienced the forces of gravity. I kind of rather standing by for sonic boom now. Skylab Houston through a row one. How do you read? Actually, we're going to be back clear in Houston. Everything's okay. We're out of 40,000. Very good, Pete. You're in the group. Hello, recovery. Hello, recovery. Skylab on the main. Everything's okay. And this is recovery. Uh, we have a visual below the overcast about uh, 100. Uh, recovery, uh, splash down and it looks like stable one. 